Hello, everybody, and welcome to My Two Sats. My name is CJK, and today I'm joined by Peter Dunworth of the BTC Advisor. My latest epiphany with Bitcoin is pristine collateral, the perfect collateral, the perfect asset, perfect money. All of a sudden, completely changes and redefines risk as we know it. A lot of investors don't really comprehend the difference between risk and volatility. They're going to start figuring that out when Bitcoin is accepted as the best form of collateral. Now there's a better gold than gold in Bitcoin as a store of value. The problem that we have with every other asset bar Bitcoin is that there's no hedging the system from within the system. And this is the only asset that you can hedge the system because it's outside the system. And so this is where I think even myself probably underestimates how big Bitcoin can go because it needs to inflate not only to the value of the collateral, but it needs to overinflate to the level of the debt so that you've got the buffer available. All of a sudden, this means the potential for Bitcoin going up is even bigger than, than I first thought. Hello, everybody, and welcome to My Two Sats. My name is CJK, and today I'm joined by Peter Dunworth of the BTC Advisor. We're going to get his two sats on Bitcoin as the perfect three-point asset, the most pristine form of collateral in the world, and the true risk-free rate of return. Peter, welcome, and thanks for joining me. It's an absolute delight to be here with you. Peter, you're one of my favorite people in the industry. And before I sit back and take notes on what I know is going to be a Bitcoin masterclass, I want to start off with you sharing maybe one of your favorite orange pill moments. I know with your level of understanding, you probably had multiple orange pill moments. Share one of those great moments with us in the audience. Oh, good question. I think um, probably the most recent epiphany for me and this is something we're going to talk about is really understanding what perfect collateral means and we're going to go through that in detail but um there's a story behind that too and i was around um i was on the wrong side well on on the on the credit side of the balance sheet during the gfc or just before the gfc and my father's financial advisor said that's not a great place to be you might want to be on the other side of the balance sheet move into equities um and and so what as Bitcoin develops and starts getting institutionalized, I see the opportunity for this to be ingratiated into traditional finance in ways that we've seen done before, but have led to systemic blowups like the GFC. And, and this is where um, my latest epiphany with Bitcoin is, oh my goodness, pristine collateral, the perfect collateral, the perfect asset, the perfect money, all of a sudden completely changes and redefines risk as we know it. And I talk a lot about risk v volatility, and a lot of uh, a lot of investors don't really comprehend the difference between risk and volatility. But they're going to start start figuring that out when Bitcoin is accepted as the best form of collateral, and uh, that is what you get. That that's that's what gets you the cheapest interest rate in, in any of your loans. Now we're nowhere near that at the moment, but that's what I forecast coming, and I'm starting to see that take place. Oh, man, that's beautiful. And I, I can't wait to dive into it. But before we get into it, let's focus on your entire three point asset thesis, how Bitcoin is that perfect asset that nothing else can stand up to. Yeah, it's it's something that we've never seen before. And, you know, this is staring at assets you know, for the best part of um, the last two and a half decades and trying to figure out what is what is the best investment, what's the best asset you want to hold. Um, being an Australian, we're obsessed with property and with property comes leverage if you want to do that successfully in any in any type of scale. So there's a there's a background in understanding what makes um, that asset great. But when you look and compare it to Bitcoin as as the three functions of money firstly, um, and then expand that out to you know take in all of the other assets, what you have is effectively Bitcoin as being the perfect money because you have um, yeah, the three functions of money being store of value, meat of exchange, and unit of account. Th this is the first time in history, the first time you know, in written history anyway, that we see an asset that is the best at all three functions of money at the same time. And this is something that I find truly fascinating, that for the first time we have a better gold than gold, and that is what typically was you know the leader as far as store of value goes over the last 5000 years we could you know rely on gold being you know a reliable store of value there's that old adage that you know an ounce of silver uh, an ounce of gold will will buy you a really nice savile row suit for the last 2 or 300 years whatever that might be and it still you know kind of holds today but now there's a better gold than gold in bitcoin as a store of value and 
but and this is probably a little deeper than we need to go but the the problem with store of value in today's day and age with you know the the zero rate um, or zero interest rate environment that we've been in for the last god knows how long and it's only recently changed is that all of a sudden all these other assets are now store of value too because there's nowhere to hide and and this is the problem and we can go into that later but when you move along to mean of exchange this is a better mean of exchange as a second function of money than the us dollar i believe because you don't have to suffer any debasement and there's no censorship of your money so you can move your money whenever wherever you want um, and <clears throat> most importantly there's no debasement because of that strict supply and issuance schedule so you're, you're relying on the 21 million and those rules are enforced by the network um, and and that network in itself is probably the greatest security measure we have as a you know both a cryptographic and a and a monetary network and computer network so it's it's the strongest at all three at the at the one time which makes it very unique from you know ensuring that your, your money is going to be preserved and then the final one which is really absolute dork talk but i really love it because that's where a lot of the value is stored is the unit of account and and this is where the 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 problem that we have with every other asset bar bitcoin is that there's no hedging the system from within the system and this is the only asset that you can hedge the system because it's outside the system that's if you hold it and self-custody it but if you're in an etf then you don't get any hedge from the system because your etf is by definition within the system so you have a huge huge problem there and this is why i advocate for self-custody um the etfs are great and i look at that as a top of funnel to get more people into bitcoin but once they go down the rabbit hole they'll soon realize you know what they're holding isn't isn't quite what they thought they were and they need to swap it out for something different well said now you know i say about the store of value of bitcoin is engineered money it, it was strategically designed to leverage the natural laws of economics and commodity cycles and price discovery is that what you think it really makes it stand out from any other asset is it's designed engineered element or is there something else or even is there even more than that that really makes it a store of value that humanity has never seen before i, I love your take on that like I've got to say some of your takes on this are some of my favorites. So I've, I've got to say it's a real thrill to be chatting to you about this. I've really been looking forward to it. But um, I, I think, yes, it is perfectly engineered money. And this is where I, I don't know when they designed it, if they understood what the functions or the outputs were going to be. And so um, I haven't gone into as deeply as you have the perfectly engineered money. But what I look at is what are some of the key technologies that have come out of it that we've never seen before? And this is where, you know, that old adage, uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> and, and this is what puts a lot of people off, because in traditional finance, when you see something that sounds too good to be true, <laughs> it's an instant red flag and you don't need to look at it any further. But when you talk of, you know, perfect money and perfectly engineered money that is, you know, the best asset we've ever seen, it, it sparks a lot of red flags. So I try and take a step back from that. I think, well, the four, four unique things that I think are absolute game-changing technologies that have come out of the back of the perfectly engineered money is going to be um, absolute digital scarcity. That is a huge concept and with, with, with all um, fair reason, up until Bitcoin was invented, that, that term was literally an oxymoron. It did not, it did not exist digital scarcity. And now we have absolute digital scarcity, which is, you know, very unique in its own right. The next we have is seizure resistant. Never before were we able to walk around with a cryptographic, you know, 12 words in our head and go to the grave with it. This is the first time in history that's been able to be done. So we now have a seizure resistant asset that, you know, if you're prepared to die for it, people can't take it from you. Now that you know, is a huge deterrent for, you know, all sorts of violence and the rest of it. And, you know, in thinking about this in pragmatic terms, you know, I bet Russia wish they had have had their foreign reserves in Bitcoin, you know, yeah. they wouldn't have had them seized. And, you know, if they did have it in Bitcoin and they had it seized, well, the whole Bitcoin show would be over and we'd know it's, you know, it's um, susceptible to not feasance. So seizure resistance is a big thing. Censorship resistance is a huge thing. And then the, the granddaddy of them all, I think, when combined with absolute digital scarcity, is your, your immutable ledger. Now, that represents, you know, without going into the details of what this means in accounting terms and the rest of it, because that's, you know, quite frankly, really boring. Sorry to any accounts listening. But 
what this means in you know no hyperbole here in in human terms this represents the third era of humanity this represents you know the three eras being pre-written word written word and now we have recorded word that cannot be cannot be changed this represents a leap function change in technology that we've never seen before and i look at those four things and i think if i told you this asset had one of those things that would sound amazing and it's a trillion dollar asset in its own right but then when you combine all four of those things into the one thing that really is too good to be true and people think oh no it can't be can't be possible and you know what's stopping someone making the next bitcoin and it's like well we've kind of had 30,000 attempts at alternate <laughs> alternates to bitcoin and no one's been able to nail it i don't know if another 30,000 attempts are going to get close but <laughs> yeah absolutely not well said and and then after you explain to them all of those store value characteristics it's already too good to be true and now we move on to medium of exchange so how does bitcoin become the best medium of exchange and do you have any concerns with bitcoin's ability to increase velocity you know do you see lightning or other l2 solutions playing a big role yeah i do i think um i think and this is probably not going to be um, too popular what I say, but I think there's going to be um, layer twos like Liquid and Lightning are going to play a huge part. And I also think there's going to be stable coins on Bitcoin, on those L2s. And I think just from looking at the U UTXOs and how many of them are and the limitations of the daily transactions per day, it no one, not, not the entire world, 8 billion people can't have L1 transactions as we know it. So we need to have scaling technology. And this is similar to the arguments put forward for the internet. The internet doesn't scale where everything's on that one layer. There's multiple different um, layers to it. And, and we've got a functioning, you know, internet where, you know, I can talk to you on the other side of the Pacific and we have a you know live live stream. It's unbelievable. But in the same way, you know, the internet got built out in layers, we're going to get this built out in layers. And I think the other thing that's going to help with adoption and hyper Bitcoinization is having a US dollar stable coin on Bitcoin. Now, Liquid looks like probably the, you know, one of the best ways to do that. I know with Taproot, um, Lightning now has that functionality as well. So that'll be built out. Um, I look at this and think that's kind of the Trojan horse to getting the rest of the world onto um, the US dollar and then ultimately onto a Bitcoin, um, a Bitcoin standard. You know, I don't want to go into unit of account because, like you said, it's boring. But when you talk about stable coins on Bitcoin, I do think that you get into that, you know, people's ears perk up and they're like, well, wait, wait a second. Is it Bitcoin or is it dollars? Is I wonder, because I think about this all the time, the more and more I understand Bitcoin, the more and more I see it as the Band-Aid to our infrastructure, right? We have a crumbling infrastructure as debt-based collateral just evaporates as they raise interest rates to try to fight yeah. inflation, which diving into that, it's just with fiscal dominance, it's it's a losing fight. But I think, and I, I, I want to get your angle on this, are we going to see accelerated Bitcoin integration into the current system? And then if so, what does that mean for Bitcoin as a store of value and a medium of exchange? uh <clears throat> this that that's a very poignant question that i think holds uh, like it's a really deep I'll, I'll, I'll give you my best on this um we we have a debt problem and if you've got a debt problem you've either got a debt problem or, or a collateral problem so it's you know one side of the coin you know you take your pick at the moment we're focusing on the debt saying we've got a debt problem because we don't have enough collateral it's that simple. So how do we fix that? We either pay the debt down, which isn't going to happen, or we inflate the asset values so that we no longer have a, you know, debt to GDP problem or, you know, a collateral problem. And I look at this and I think the, the number one or the easiest way to solve that equation is to find and pump money into the asset that goes up the fastest with the least amount of capital injected into it. Mm. So you know, let's go through the asset classes that can solve this. Gold, we can solve that with gold, but that's a $15 trillion market cap. We can solve that with property. That's somewhere between 100 to 300 trillion, depending on, you know, how you want to value it. So you've got to pump in a lot of money to do that. 
stock market is somewhere between 100 and 200 maybe even 300 trillion dollars choose your own adventure as to what you think it's it's valued at but it's a huge amount and so there's a huge amount of capital that needs to be injected into that in order to inflate prices and the bond market's a 300 trillion dollar market at least so how do you inflate the bond market you know you've got to inject a lot of capital and then i look at this tiny little thing called bitcoin which is barely a trillion dollar market cap that's really tightly held there's less than 10 percent of bitcoins available on exchange for purchase and i think one trillion dollars into that market would probably solve or go a long way to solving the collateral problem that we have and so i look at this and think if if i'm running the world well i want to solve it for the you know for the most in the most efficient way so do I want to spend $100 trillion printing money to save the property market, or do I want to solve the collateral problem by printing money to buy a trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin? And for me, I want to buy a trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin, firstly, because I hold it. So full disclosure, I want to pump my bags. <laughs> but secondly, I want it for the lowest cost possible to society. And so what happens then is you have that collateral go through the roof. And then that is, and, and this is probably segues really nicely into the next conversation of Bitcoin being the perfect form of collateral to underpin our debt system. And what a lot of people don't really understand is that our current debt system is underpinned by only a very small sliver of liquid capital. So it's it's leveraged, it's you know, factored out the wazoo so that they're trading typically somewhere between a 10 to a 50x leverage on the actual capital that they've got sitting on their balance sheet. Now, what's interesting about Bitcoin as collateral is that you can't do that. It's actually the inverse because you need to have over collateralized loans. And so this is where I think even myself probably underestimates how big Bitcoin can go because it needs to inflate not only to the value of the collateral, but it needs to over inflate to the level of the debt so that you've got the buffer available because no one wants to do. And, and this is the problem with Bitcoin that you can't uh, rehypothecate Bitcoin because there's only a certain amount of it. So by default, you have to have an over collateralized loan. So all of a sudden, this means the potential for Bitcoin going up is even bigger than than I first thought. That's right. People don't, you know, people hear some of your price predictions and they go, you know, what's what's going on here? But the deeper you get down that rabbit hole and the more you understand where this is going, the more those prices start to make sense because you hear people talk about it all the time with gold. Oh, let's just reprice gold to fifty thousand dollars. Well, what what do they mean when they say reprice gold? Exactly what you just described to make up for the gap in equity that just doesn't exist today because of what they've done to the system. So it's really great to hear you say that, and it does transition per perfectly into our next segment, which will be about Bitcoin as the most pristine form of collateral. And I want to bring up um, some tweets that you um, have sent out and. The first one is talking about um, sovereign banks printing money to buy stocks. When will they start printing money to buy Bitcoin? Once they start buying Bitcoin, it will be the beginning of the end for the bond market. Tick tock. And I, I want you to elaborate on that, but I want to cover this next tweet at the same time because I know it's, it's connected. You say the next wave of institutional money looks like this. And we're talking about protected capital notes, Bitcoin backed capital notes. You were alluding to it in the in the previous segment, but you said this product could be the financial singularity that ushers in the suddenly and then gradually part of what we've all been waiting for in this process of adoption and this process of Bitcoin becoming um, establishing itself. I think we all know that on Wall Street, Bitcoin's being institutionalized as digital gold, but they're like a whole cycle or two behind us on the narrative of what's really happening. Right now, all the tools like us at People's Reserve, Lightning, Liquid, and other people are building the tools that evolve Bitcoin from that $14 trillion store of value to the multi-hundred trillion dollar money market pristine collateral that it is. So when we talk about your tweets about bonds being in trouble, governments having to make up their mind on this asset class, where do you see that all going? And where, where, do you, where should we look in the world today to see the example of what it could look like to have a Bitcoin backed economy? Oh, that, that's a really big question. I might take a step back and, and, and talk about what was 
what what has been the problem problem traditionally for you know a leveraged or a credit economy which is what we live in and the the biggest credit breakdown that we've seen in the last 20 years was the gfc and if we look at the you know the 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 genesis story of that what the problem with the gfc or what caused the gfc was is that you had wall street having an insatiable demand for these mortgage-backed securities so what they'd do is they would ask main street bank for the mortgages they'd slice and dice them package them up and then on sell them off their balance sheet to an institutional buyer like a pension or an insurance company hedge fund you name it and it was off their balance sheet they didn't have any liability so what happened was wall street put more and more pressure on main street banks to go and find lenders and properties to leverage so what was the end result of 10 years of you know high pressure from wall street to get more and more of this this product on, on their books was you know you ended up going out the risk curve of both collateral and the borrower and so what you ended up with was the ninja loans no application no income no job applicants and you know I, I say this you know jokingly but what it ended up with is you know um sadly a mexican uh, strawberry picker in southern california having having a million dollar mortgage that he was responsible for that anyone in their right mind would say that that was a bad idea but the bank said we're happy to give it to you under this ninja loan and then wall street was happy to buy it knowing full well that it was a jump bond they could slice and dice it package it up sell it as triple a even though it was really written as you know, absolute junk and then they'd on sell that to the market and they were just waiting for it to blow up now there are a couple of very smart people who understood that this was going to be a problem and michael Burry and the rest of it you know the big short the story the movie we've all seen you know basically bet on that and and one big but that's a problem with the collateral because the you know the the thing that's under underwriting the value of the collateral is the borrower and as the borrower gets weaker and weaker and weaker by default, the value of the collateral needs to drop and drop and drop because there's no one to pay it. And I just need to outline that that's what traditional credit, you know, mortgage-backed securities looks like. And then what I see happening in the very near future, and I think Wall Street's going to get it quicker than we think because they're going to make a shit ton of money on the back of this. Like, they're going to make so much money, it's going to make their eyes cry. Like, and, and I look at this and I think, well, what exactly am I, you know, talking about here? What I'm talking about with the principal protected note is effectively a capital guaranteed product where, you know, JP Morgan issues a $10 billion note and they say, right, we're capital guaranteeing the value of this $10 billion. And what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, you know, it's a five-year note. We're going to put 80% of the value of that note, $8 billion, into five-year US treasuries. Now, assuming that the US Treasury of the US government is, you know, your risk-free, you know, risk-free lender, and there's no no um, no risk on getting paid back from the US government, which last time I checked, as bad as we think it is, everyone else is worse. So, you know, they're still the best of a bad bunch. Um, that is still the case. So that's the risk free of getting your capital back. Now, just a, a side note, you're getting that capital back in nominal terms, not real terms. So it's not a real real rate that you're getting back. You're just getting back the capital you put in in nominal terms. And what they do with the remaining 20% of that allows them to then go and and buy Bitcoin with it. And so what you've got is when you invest 80% on a five year US treasury at 5%, that grows at 5% per annum. So 80 goes to, um, you know, 88, 90, and it gets to the full value of what you invested in the five year period through the interest. And then that allows them to then go out and go and buy Bitcoin with the remaining 20%. And doing some really rough back testing on this, this enables, uh, you know, the banks to offer um, a capital guaranteed product that will have a yield of close to 18% per annum on completion. Wow. Now that's only made available because the interest rates of the five year US Treasury are circa 5%. If they were at the zero bound, they wouldn't be able to do that. But now that you've got the five year and the 10 year, you know, is the five years at circa five and the 10 years, last time I checked at about 4.6%, all of a sudden you can do that now because you can build in the, you know, the capital guarantee and have the you know the the capital guaranteed with the note and grow to the value of the initial put in and then you can have the free kick with your bitcoin so you staple that product together and all of a sudden you know wall street can sell a hundred billion dollars of this a week yeah. and if that's the case like it's going to make the etf flows look look inconsequential 
And, you know, for anyone who's been in and around markets, they think, you know, initially you think that, you know, the, the all markets are driven by, um, by the equities. And you soon realise that no one gives a shit about the equities market. That's not where Wall Street drives, you know, drives value and, you know, earns all their fees. They earn all their fees on the debt side of the markets, not the equity side. And you look at all of the major CEOs of the major banks, where have they spent most of their time when they've come up through the ranks? It's always from the bond markets. So I look at this and think most people look at equities and it's the flashy, pretty stuff over here, but the real juice of the all of the banks is in the debt side of the, the market. Now, what this principal protected note allows you to do is it allows the likes of JP Morgan to make a fortune, probably two to 5% upfront on selling a $10 billion bond. They could sell one of those a week with their eyes shut. You know, that's 500 million, that's circa $20 billion a year that they could make on that one single product. And what does that do in the context of the market that we're looking at? Firstly, it's going to drive 10x flows on the ETFs into Bitcoin to start with. And they can do that by stapling the, the BlackRock ETF to the, the US government, government treasuries. Um, that would be the easiest way to do it. They don't have to buy the underlying, they can let BlackRock do it. Now, it's really great for the banks. It's great for Bitcoiners, but most importantly, and this is what's often overlooked, is you know the the federal government has a um, has a crisis in the fact that it's got an identity problem, and it's coming very close to a topic that you talk a lot about, which is trust. Now they they they're having to come in the scale of um, of trust on their treasuries. They used to be able to issue thirty year treasuries. Now no one wants them. They've just told them, don't even sell that shit to us because we're not buying it. They said that on the 20 year. They've said that on the 10 year. These guys are down to the five year now. And the last, you know, I think it was a week ago, not even, we had that, um, you know, the worst US Treasury um, auction since uh, in the last, th say, three years. And 24% of the bonds didn't get purchased. Now I'm looking at this and thinking, well, I, have I got a solution to you? You, Mr. US government, do you want to print a shit ton of notes? Yes, we do. Please tell us how to do it. Why don't we package it up in this where we are going to have an insatiable demand to print as much of this shit as you want to, and we'll package it up into these capital guaranteed products. We'll sell it to all the bond funds, pension funds, insurance companies, and we're going to drive demand. And we're going to, you know, that little thing called the GFC and the credit event that happened there. We're going to make that look like a pimple on an elephant. This thing is going to be enormous. And I look at this and I think that actually serves everyone. But if I take a step back and think, well, are we going to have a GFC style blow up on the back of that? And the answer is no, we're not, because Bitcoin being the perfect form of collateral, the pristine collateral with no counterparty risk, no borrower required. We don't need to assess what their capital, you know, what, what their capacity is. We don't need to assess whether or not they've got the character repay, to repay it. This is a 24-7, 365 liquid market that can be liquidated instantly. All of a sudden, we can plow as much money as we want into that asset being Bitcoin without any concern about it blowing up because the only thing it's going to blow up is itself. It's just going to drop in value when people exit it. Wow, that is so well described. I really enjoyed that description. I, I um, Well, you know, we're, we're working on very similar products, so I couldn't be more excited. I think people don't understand how close this is. Uh, and now, and then it comes down to economic incentive, right? We don't have to sell you a product like this. It sells itself. The demand is going to shift by itself and it's going to be whoever's offering that product in a regulatory way that is going to be able to make that market. So we're really excited for this product at People's Reserve as well as our self-repaying mortgage. And I, I love the way that you explained how Bitcoin replaces whether it's real estate or if it's debt back debt for goodness sake like whatever it is the asset side of the balance sheet is increasing and i think you know look no further than el salvador to understand that bitcoin backed economies are going to be defining the risk free rate of return in the future aren't they yeah these yeah. these governments who are printing and printing and printing yes like you said we're going to get our money there's no doubt we're going to get our money but what we're learning is when we get our money, we don't know what the hell we're going to be able to buy. So there is risk to this. It's the inflation risk. And when you have such a fiscal dominance uh, in the in the budget with no because it's thirty four trillion dollars debt, two hundred and eleven unfunded liabilities, the the math just doesn't add up. There's no way out of it. Sure, we can reprice gold, but why? Why when you have 
this pristine collateral as an emerging asset class, the perfect solution. And governments are shunning it right now. It's almost like it's the it's it's the cure that they need, but they just don't know it yet. And I think El Salvador, you know, look at them. They're getting their credits increased because like you said perfectly, the asset side of your balance sheet grows. So if your liabilities stay the same, technically that's like your liabilities are shrinking. So you're just going to strengthen your economy. You're going to strengthen your balance sheet. You're going to enable more printing. You're going to uh, strengthen the entire system by integrating Bitcoin. And I, I don't know how many cycles we are from that being a realization of governments, uh, because we're, you know, I, I think we're in a kleptocracy. So it's a fight for who can get control of the printer and who can send that money where it goes to. But yeah. with BlackRock playing a role now. Hong Kong ETFs going up. They were like kind ETFs too in Hong Kong, aren't they? That's a big deal. That is yeah. huge. Yeah, so, that's a mega deal. I I, I thought um, it was an in kind in, but I'm not sure if it's an in kind withdrawal. Okay. But if it is, I presume it, it would be both ways. But all of a sudden, that's going to put huge pressure on the the American ETFs to say, hey, you need to have this facility too, or we're just going to leave our Bitcoin in in Hong Kong and. This, this is, you know, what we're seeing in real time is this nation state competition play out in real life. And what has been a traditional feature of the US market over the last, call it 150 years, has been a flight of capital from around the world has found its way to the US because of, you know, very strong regulations, a great legal framework, property rights. And you know that you basically, if you invest in the US, you, you were protected by the best rules and regulations globally. Um, but if you can't get an in-kind redemption of your Bitcoin, there's going to be a lot of people who say that's a that's a an absolute uh, deal breaker for me. I, I'm going to put my money into Hong Kong, and if I need my money or Bitcoin, I'll I'll just press the button and take the in-kind withdrawal. So um, this will force pressure on on the U.S. capital markets to adjust and you know make an amendment. But I think part of the reason why that the, the ETFs didn't get any of the uh, in-kind compensations to start with was because they didn't want grayscale having that ability to do that so a little bit of a little bit of politics and competition going on in i here. presume so, I presume so. <laughs> amazing how fast it's moving though right the etfs just being put through in the united states and now already etfs 2.0 and i'm soon around the corner 3.0 and just making it more easy more accessible i i really you know the etf buyers this weekend probably had a hard time because you want to buy the dip and there's nothing you can do. You don't get yeah. the best. You don't get to buy the best of the dips. You don't get access to that 24, seven, three, six, five liquid market. So hopefully they'll be coming to people like yourself and the Bitcoin advisor to get their custody set up right and get access to the real market and not have to uh, be stuck in these ETFs while we wait for them to be optimized. Yeah, I, I think it happens and it's, you know, I just, have um amnesia when it comes to not knowing about bitcoin you know i think i've always known about bitcoin and sadly i've made every mistake in the book or i feel like i have and i think it's really important for us to just be patient there's going to be a lot of new people coming to bitcoin every year more and more people piling in and you know they've got to go through their own personal learning journey they've got to you know touch the stove as as people say they've got to understand what this asset is and it just takes time like it is such a complicated asset that revolves around so many different facets. Um, it, it's really difficult to get. And I'm just grateful that I've got my brother who was there and very patient with me to kind of just nudge me in the right direction when I was about to go off on a tangent. So I think that's probably one of the most critical things we can all do as Bitcoiners is to just be very patient and um, accommodating to questions. And I think as a community, I haven't seen a community quite as um, giving of their time and um, patient with you know, answering questions. And, you know, we're still ans answering Peter Schiff's questions. So, <laughs> so 10 if, years down the track. If, if you're watching this podcast right now and you're new to Bitcoin and maybe you're not like myself and Peter, we've gone to the bottom of the rabbit hole. We've planted dynamite and we've gone deeper, you know, and we set up some furniture so people could learn. If you haven't made it down there yet and you're just starting out, I have to, I highly recommend the BTC advisor team. You guys go to them. They're going to take care of you. They're going to set you up. You can feel comfortable. You can feel safe. You don't need to understand Bitcoin 120,000% before you get in. That's what these guys are here for, to help you take those initial baby steps 
get set up the proper way. And Peter won't plug it, but I'll plug it for him because I recommend him and his team. They're going to take care of you. Now, when we were talking, you mentioned interest rates. I'm really interested to know what you think is going to happen with interest rates over the next six months to one year. Oh, Ah, this is easy because you're either right or wrong. So we're going to figure it out really quickly. But I, I personally think we're going to see rates go up. And, you know, to to have a look at, you know, what Jerome Powell's facing, I think it's a very, very tough situation. He's a rock and a hard place. He can't lower interest rates because he's going to send, you know, the mother of all asset bubbles through the roof. And he can't put up interest rates because it's going to jack him on inflation. And this is this is the major problem that they're facing. They... They can't really afford to put interest rates up and this is where um this is a little defeatist of me but it it's just absolutely ground me down over the last say three or four years but i've watched our financial institutions the federal reserve being the most you know the most revered institution globally come out and lie on three different different occasions they came out and said inflation was transitory that was bullshit. we all knew it was bullshit. They said money printing doesn't have anything to do with inflation. We know that's a lie too. We had two of the Federal Reserve board members um, found guilty of insider trading and kicked off the board. Now, these are positions that you need to be, you know, have a net worth of over 10 to $20 million just to get a seat at the table at these institutions. And to think these types of people are nickel and diming trying to get an edge by placing insider bets. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane. And then you know, the final thing that sort of really broke me was, I think, December 2022. Um, it might have been December 21. It's a long time ago, but you can look it up. Uh, the Philly Fed, which is responsible for the jobs report, came out and said that, um, oh, sorry, the jobs re report from back in June that year, uh, we missed over a million unemployed people. We've gone back, counted it up, and now we found another extra million unemployed from six months previously. Now, what was in the middle of, of that? We had the midterms, so it was highly inappropriate for them to comment and report the real the real figures of an extra million people unemployed because it meant the the Dems were going to suffer a, a red wave at that midterm election. So we've just had all of our financial institutions politi politicised to a point where you cannot rely on them. And there used to be a joke, you know, you'd never trust anything coming out of China. That beige book that used to have all of their you know economic data in there. Um, was just like, oh, it's just like throwing darts at a dartboard. What's what's the unemployment rate? Oh, throw a dart. What's the GDP? <laughs> You'd have more luck doing that because the results on the dartboard meant just as much as what was in the book. Now, fast forward with the beige book. If they if if you call them out on anomalies that don't make sense and you know that can't be you know what they report, they just withdraw that 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 bit of information in future reports. So you can't cross reference and and check out what they're reporting. So it's like that old adage of, you know, how do you know you've got a good accountant? Ask them what one plus one is. If they're any good, they'll close the blinds and they'll whisper in your ear, what do you want it to be? And <laughs> this is what all of these institutions are doing globally. So I'm like, this is really hard. Like, you know, my business is helping people, you know, uh, make and preserve wealth. And I'm reliant on all this information to make decisions on what investments we need to make in order to outperform the market. And it's difficult when the market participants and the regulators are bullshitting to you. This is the major problem that I face. And this is where, having understood all of that, you know, I move more and more of my personal assets and my clients' assets into Bitcoin because it's the number one thing that I can trust. Now, Bitcoin might be, you know, um, full of crap and, you know, not reliable and all the rest of it, but everything is relative. And... Bitcoin relative to everything else, well, like we were talking about earlier, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the pristine asset. That is the pristine collateral. The world just hasn't figured it out yet. And when they do, I expect a flow from all the other assets into Bitcoin. Mm. And do you think there's a lot of monetary pre... I know you're familiar with my cost structure analysis. You know, all in a sustaining cost of gold around $1,900. You hear uh, Peter Schiff always talk about Oh, the price of gold's at new all-time highs, so the miners should be at new all-time highs. Yeah, but the cost to pull the gold out of the ground and supply it to the market six, seven years ago, or even even longer, back at the previous peak, was significantly lower, $1,100, $1,200. Now it's reaching 2000 So the even though the price of gold is up, 
the cost has gone up because of inflation and the margins are getting squeezed and people kind of forget about that kind of that hidden cost on the producer side of things because you know most of us are just consumers so i think um when we when we talk about interest rates and what you know obviously the governments they can't you you said it perfectly they can't raise it they can't lower it this is kind of bitcoin's time to shine isn't it it's like they they need this solution they need exactly what you just described a hybrid commodity based debt product that is principal protected uh, and then that's going to allow them to make a move with interest rates because otherwise we're just going to be stuck in this higher for longer situation like you said they raise it up they're going to they could scare people yield curve normalizes from the long end you're going to lose control of a lot you're just going to it's going to force yield curve control which is just more inflation then you yeah. lower the rates we don't Sure, if you lower the rates, we get lower inflation because the interest expense, the cost structure burdens will come down. But all that principal and capital sitting on the sidelines is going to become rushing back into the marketplace. So it's like they literally can't lower, they can't hire. Bitcoin's sitting here just like, hello, hello, I'm right here for you, use me. And it's just like, when the hell are these people going to wake up? And I, 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 that's why I was so interested in El Salvador with their Bitcoin bonds. Have you heard anything about Bitcoin bonds and – um maybe where Max Kaiser and El Salvador are in, in the progress of that? No, I, I would like to understand that a whole lot more in a lot more detail. And my initial assumption with the, the Bitcoin bonds um, out of El Salvador is that the, the only thing that's a hindrance to, um, to that is that I think there is some link to Bitcoin mining of the, of the Bitcoin. So that that will skew the underlying asset in the in the bonds to, you know, and you've done a lot more work on the cost structure of Bitcoin miners. So that'll potentially skew that bond. Um, I would have thought potentially to the downside unless they catch that tick in the market where it really gets the super profits, which, you know, unfortunately, the super profits only stick around for maybe a year at best, uh, maybe a year and a half for the Bitcoin miners before markets adjust and those super profits start contracting again. And I think my concern on on that side versus the bonds, because I don't know too much about the El Salvadorian bonds, but on the Bitcoin mining front, the, the thing that concerns me is if you look at, you know, 30,000 foot view of, you know, the global electricity grid, we've got 60% per se going to ground that's never consumed. So we only consume 40%. We still haven't ripped through even 1% of that 60% that's gone to waste. So that's going to completely alter and skew the results we get for this, you know, um, cost of mining and how that, you know, relates to the Bitcoin price. But I think once we chew through all the waste energy, that's going to attract a whole host of in, in, uh, national or nation state players to start Bitcoin mining because there's this free energy just sitting there. And this is where I think the, the lesser Bitcoin miners are going to have a huge amount of competition because it's very difficult to compete with free energy from a nation state. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And that's, you know, that's it's very astute pickup of you. I'm not surprised that you picked it up. But that's my concern with these Bitcoin denominated bonds as well. And that's why I'm so interested in your thesis of Bitcoin stable coins, because I think what happened is you got a lot of these fiat maxi bros who came into the industry the block fives, the Celsius, the Voyagers, and they brought this rehypothecation scheme into this marketplace thinking that they were going to rule the world. Uh, and you're, you're bringing it into an economy that just works different. The internet economy doesn't work like the government's economies. It's, a, it's yeah. an equity-based economy, not a debt-based economy. So you're just not going to get the same results. And these people come in with the mindset of, oh, yeah, uh, I want to lend out my Bitcoin so that I can earn interest because when I lend out my Bitcoin, that's how I earn money. But the, it hasn't really clicked for these people yet that the way that you earn money with Bitcoin is not by lending it out, but by borrowing it against it, right? Borrowing yeah. against the Bitcoin is – Michael Saylor is laying this plan out perfectly for everybody to see the empirical evidence of this, of a, of a patient speculative attack on the dollar and using that Bitcoin equity – growing the asset side of your balance sheet while your liability stays the same it's all there for them so my question is are we going to need a private company like people's reserve or a company that you're working on uh to issue a product like this to jumpstart a fire under the government 
or are we going to get the existing broker dealers to create this this hybrid product how do you see this market this product coming to market do you see uh, a rebel capitalist like myself uh entering the market and and changing the paradigm or do you think it's going to take more than that you think it's going to take uh lobbying and extreme political effort to make this a reality i think come one come all i think there's going to be multiple different options when it comes to this and i think there's a place for everyone and even even the traditional fiat bros who think that we're going to rehypothecate and just to give you an example of this that you know um, some lending that we do have available today um, and i'll just break it down and take a step back there are going to be people who say that bitcoin is property like michael saylor and there are going to be people who say that bitcoin is collateral uh, sorry is um is currency like bukele and those two things are going to have very different outcomes when it comes to borrowing, I believe. In the, in the property sense, you're not going to be able to rehypothecate that. So it's going to be like an unchained loan or an over collateralized loan where you put your Bitcoin up, um, you put that on the platform, it's over collateralized, and you can borrow somewhere between 30 and 70% on it, depending on how risky you want to be. And they'll charge you an interest rate of somewhere between 10 to 15%, presumably because it's taken as property, they can't re it, they can't get additional fees on the back of it by lending it out, so they've got to make the margin on the rate that they charge you. And then the other side of the equation is going to be you, you value it or you account for it as currency, which means it can go onto the bank's balance sheets and they can then re that 20 times. And so what they do is they can create on say 10 million bucks worth of Bitcoin, they can re and create $200 million worth of loans. And because they can create $200 million worth of loans, rather than charging you 15% for it, they may actually pay you to borrow money from them. So on your $10 million, you may borrow a million dollars, but they've lent out $200 million on the back of that collateral because it's currency on their balance sheet. So they own it. It's you know their liability to you. But it's not yours and you've got no control over it. You've got no oversight and they can rehypothecate it out the wazoo. And so they're going to make somewhere between two to four million dollars on lending the two hundred million dollars out and they'll pay you five percent or ten percent of the million dollars that you borrow just to get access to your capital to boost the credit markets and this is where i look at this and think bitcoin is a form of collateral thing you know a lot of people think this is the end of the credit markets it's like nah you haven't even seen anything yet this is the start of the credit markets you think it's bad now wait till you see what they do with this because it's going to explode credit markets before it falls on its own own weight and moves into over collateralized but that represents two very different skews of what's going to happen and if you look at those two ends of the spectrum we've got unchained with property and if you look at you know getting paid to borrow on your bitcoin the best I can see at the moment out there is Abra has a lending facility that if you borrow 15% or less on your Bitcoin, they'll give you an interest rate of 0%. Mm. So they're effectively rehypothecating your Bitcoin. They just don't, you know, make that explicitly clear. And that's the only reason they can afford to give you $500,000 on your Bitcoin for 0%. Mm. So if you're comfortable with that level of risk, then you can have a 0% loan now. But for me, I... I really like my Bitcoin and I don't want to lose it. And, you know, in my head, I'm figuring out that, you know, we've got, I think over the next 10 years, we've got an average annualized yield of probably a hundred percent. And so in order for me to, you know, make sure I see that over the next 10 years, I want to make sure that I'm controlling that in the best way possible. So the, the lending facility needs to be, you know, have that custody locked down and no rehypothecation confirmed or an over collateralized loan, as opposed to, going to Abra and them having them do whatever they want with my Bitcoin, because I know it's going to be really hard for me to get the Bitcoin back. So my main goal is the preservation of my Bitcoin and getting the yield out of it, which is just holding it and watching it appreciate relative to the US dollar. Amazing how Bitcoin is a productive asset by just holding it, right? Breaks, yeah. the, breaks down the paradigm. But I think something you touched on there transitions just perfectly into our final segment, which is Bitcoin is the risk-free rate of return. So can you elaborate on what that means for Bitcoin and what the future of Bitcoin as pristine collateral is going to look like in your opinion? Oh, big question. Um, I'll do my best on that one. I think, you know, I, I look at the total return of, of your asset as being, you know, your yield. 
And if you look at total return, um, you look at, you know, what income it produces as well as the capital gain that it's that it's achieved. And to me, there's no other asset that comes close to Bitcoin. And the problem with the old world thinking, and this is probably a little bit technical, but it's probably worth like it's really valuable information. So it's worth discussing and just give me a little bit of time to go through this. But with Bitcoin, it's effectively capital. So because there's no yield on it, technically, you know, I'm not earning any interest on it or income on it, but I am increasing my capital on it. So from an accounting perspective globally, whether it's the US, the UK, Australia, um, we've got a whole um, different tax set or tax regime for assessing capital gains as opposed to income. And when you when you classify a gain as capital as opposed to income, there are two different tax rates. Now, in in Australia, um, if I wanted to garner circa a, a million dollar or one and a half million dollar return per annum by selling down some capital, I'm going to need a $10 million of assets returning a 15% return in order to get that 1.5 billion cash per annum. However, if it's income that I need to receive by way of dividends from stocks or the rest of it, and I want to receive one and a half million dollars per annum, I need to find a stock portfolio that's going to pay me 8% per annum. And I need to have 37 and a half million dollars invested in that so that when I pay my tax, I can have one and a half million dollars. And this is where the tax considerations when you look at this and look at the yield and you need to have a much broader term of yield and I look at this and think you need to look at total return as yield not just the income component because the income component gets taxed out the wazoo at 50 percent per annum which makes it very difficult to compound and it's hard to grow your assets and this is why being asset rich is really important and this is the benefit and the beauty that comes with bitcoin because bitcoin is the risk-free asset it's not the volatility free asset and that's a huge distinction to make because a lot of people here buy here risk free and they think great pile in let's do this but it's like they get whipped out with a 80 percent drop and it's like whoa 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 you know you need to understand what time frames people are investing for as well and for me i look at this over a 10 year period and think bitcoin is the risk free asset moving forward and this there's nothing on earth that competes with that from a risk free component because what we're seeing is all economic activity is going to start revolving around Bitcoin more and more so. And if you take a step back to, you know, maybe six to eight years ago, Bitcoin was absolutely nowhere in the in the finance space. Now we have it, you know, we've got listed ETFs. I can tell you for a fact that these structured products will be less than 12 to 24 months away. What happens to demand when that stuff comes to market? Like it, it's a complete game changer. So the world is going to be schooled on Bitcoin and yield being total total return rather than yield being income. And this is where um, that represents a huge opportunity. And I can tell you from a TradFi perspective that having clients invested in Bitcoin, it's the greatest inoculation for fear of volatility on their traditional portfolio. So <laughs> I shouldn't laugh so much but because they're invested in Bitcoin and it's so wildly volatile it makes the 20 or 30 percent drops in their traditional portfolios look somewhat tame and it it's it's also a great learning curve to to understand that that is the future because yes it drops 80 percent, but then it goes 10x from there so you know you have have the benefit of it going up and i guess um if i may ask a question um sure yeah absolutely what do you expect over this cycle coming because you know it's been volatile we've had a really great start to the bull run obviously it's cooled off lately you know for the next 12 to 18 months 24 months what what do you see happening yeah great question i th i'm i think the biggest thing that i've come to see is that the underlying dynamics in the marketplace have changed uh, and that's best seen in my bfv charts where i track that bfv value based on my proprietary algorithm and what's happening is typically you get a big move in Bitcoin fair value after the halving because the cost of production automatically doubles. So you have OPEX going up, CAPEX going up, Bitcoin energy value going up, uh, network value to transaction going up. And all these dynamics come together and increase what I refer to as the fair value. But it's a result of the halving. We have, we have seen an, a tremendous move 
in Bitcoin fair value before the halving. We mm. have seen the first new all-time high price before the halving. So the dynamics in the marketplace are changing because what's happening is the base layer of demand for Bitcoin is growing. And it's growing at a speed that I think is faster than the internet. That's just my opinion. I don't have any empirical evidence for that. But I do believe that hash rate, the growth on hash rate, we just we just added 100 exahashes in 96 days. And the right. epoch before that was 100 exahashes in 96 days. But earlier on, we're talking about 300, 400, 700, 1200 days going through each of these 100 exahashes added to the network. So it's like the, the, the US government's like, hey, every 100 days, we're going to print a trillion dollars. And Bitcoiners are like, no problem. Every 96 days, we're going to add 100 exahashes to the network. Print it up, baby. What do you got? So I think we're going to we're going to we're going to see this relationship um, as Bitcoin trades at its commodity value. Right. Because we're th the levels that you're talking about, where we talk about Bitcoin's vertical integration into credit and debt markets. Um, that's when we start to move to monetary value. So that's when, you know, when people buy gold, they they think, oh, I'm buying this now at two thousand dollars or twenty four hundred dollars. They don't understand they're already pay paying a premium to the cost of production, but it's based on the commodity value. They're buying them. They're buying commodity value, thinking that monetary value is going to be applied later on. They're going to get the repricing in the gold to solve the problems that we addressed. We're not going to get the repricing in the gold. We're, we're actively getting, we're living through and watching with our own eyes the repricing of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. If we were going to get the repricing of gold, it'd be happening right now. It's happening in Bitcoin because the de demand on, the de base layer demand on is growing up. So I think with the ETFs and all this different plumbing being installed and the the super highway, right? The, the 401k super highway of demand of automatic income liquidity injections, mindless um, dollar cost averaging, actually benefits people when Bitcoin's on the table, right? When yeah. when Fidelity and these guys are starting to structure their Bitcoin ETFs into their portfolio products, that's actually good for we the people. Keep contributing and keep, but you know, if you really figure it out, you just contribute 100% to Bitcoin. That's That's what I think. I think this cycle is the cycle where most Bitcoiners who came into here understanding Bitcoin as digital gold, which Wall Street is doing right now, they're going to they're going to understand Bitcoin as digital collateral. And I yeah. think it's going to be a, the big role is going to be the launch of the products that you're talking about, the launch of the products that you have so astutely described and why they're better. And most importantly, why they're needed. This is a needed solution. This is we are at the proverbial end of the road. We can't raise rates. We can't lower rates. They are literally stuck. There's nothing they can do. There's consequences to both of those decisions. If they start to incorporate Bitcoin into these debt products, all of a sudden, this is the light at the end of the tunnel. This is the way that you can get out. This is the way you can reduce debt to GDP. This is everybody talks about AI being that magic trick of increasing productivity to help. Break. No, Bitcoin orange piece is the real solution, right? One percent of of 70 percent of wasted power being tapped into right now. We are going to see an explosion in hash rate that we have. I and mean, we've already seen parabolic advances in hash rate. I think we see an explosion in hash rate that we've never seen before. I think that price drives hash rate. Hash rate drives cost. Cost drives that floor price. So we'll see that. But at some point in time, at some point in time, we move away from commodity value. The cost of production to earn that block subsidy is not going to matter. Because the, the levels of demand are going to overpower the traditional commodity cycle. Because like you said, they're going to sell these notes $10 billion a week with their eyes closed, $100 billion a week with their eyes closed. And when we start getting that level of capital flow into Bitcoin, when there's, no, there's nowhere to get the supply, that's the magic of it. That's the number go up technology. There's only one way to incentivize that supply to hit the market, and it's number go up. But when number goes up, assets go up and liabilities shrink. So it, it is literally the, the perfect solution. And I I couldn't be more excited to, to offer both the self-repaying mortgage and our principled structured notes protected by Bitcoin because I'd like your math of eight, uh, what was it, 18%, right? 
Yeah, that was the last five years, but I think it's actually going to be, if you look at what's coming in the next five years, I actually think it's probably going to be closer to an 80% risk-free return with the gains that we're going to get in Bitcoin over the next five years. And with the four year, with the 10-year um, US Treasury trading at 4.6%, that opens up the ability to do a 10-year option on it where you can get 63% into a capital guaranteed treasury and then you can have the remaining 40 or 37% invested in Bitcoin, so double. And I think the returns would be probably over 120% per annum um, once those levels of capital start flowing in. And on, on the point you made about um, markets from a, from a geopolitical perspective, what happens when, you know, Russia, Qatar, Iran don't want to export their energy because they can mine Bitcoin with it? All of a sudden, think of how much money that's going to create. Like that'll be billions of dollars a day that they won't, they'll forfeit in, you know, exporting and they'll just say, fuck it, we're going to mine Bitcoin here and we'll process it here. And this is what we're going to do because we've got an insatiable demand for this product in Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. So uh, I think it helps ease a lot of geopolitical tensions too, which, you know, there's just a lot of good things that come to this market. But I'm particularly excited about this, expanding this understanding of Bitcoin as, you know, firstly, the risk-free asset and then more importantly, the pristine collateral, because I don't think a lot of people really understand that. And if if we look at um, sort of just to digress for a moment, you you know what's happening in the you know the commercial sector in the U.S. Uh, real estate sector that you know all of a sudden keys are getting handed back. A lot of the the building owners uh, aren't, don't have anyone to call to to work out their mortgage problems with because they've got commercial mortgage-backed securities, which means they've been packaged up, sold to investors, typically a pension fund, and it's it's managed by a third party. So the owner of the property can't actually go to anyone to, to resolve that problem. So what happens is they sell it on market and they take a 70% loss or lose all of their equity and the bondholders you know, walk away with a big fat nothing. Um, but what's interesting about this is, is that if we have this principal protected note, there's no need to have the commercial mortgage-backed securities. It can replace that market. It can replace the residential mortgage-backed securities. And Wall Street can slice and dice this any way they want, put it out the door, and you're not going to be hurting anyone other than Bitcoin holders. So there's no need for a borrower because you've got pristine collateral. And this is where, boy, oh boy, when the bankers figure that out, that they can actually trust it, and this is more trusted than, you know, everything else they're doing, boy, oh boy, um, yeah, number go up. <laughs> I hope we figure. I think you know, I, my one of my things about this is, and I think J.P. Morgan is the perfect example. I think uh, TD Bank too also put out a note. They like rejected Lendin, one of those one of those companies. It's a Bitcoin company. They they basically debanked them and sent them a letter. Said you know you're involved in this industry. You know we're not working with you. Um, and I saw a thing on Twitter where. Two years later, they got another letter that said, hey, check out our Bitcoin products. <laughs> so for a lot of people who watch this, you know, because we're we're anti-Fed, we're we're anti-centralization, it, it kind of becomes like a Ron Paul moment, like that meme of Ron Paul just sitting there in his pockets, like when you know what you have to do, but nobody listens. You know, yeah. look how fast Bitcoin makes people listen. It's making the bankers turn their heads. It's making the governments turn their heads. And I think we can come to a conclusion this cycle because of the power of Bitcoin to change people's mindsets, to change their incentives and to demonstrate through performance what it can do for the system overall. Um, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm absolutely thrilled to have heard your opinion. Is there anything you would like to close with the audience? Uh just an appreciation for the work that you do. I always enjoy listening to your thoughts, um, bring a great deal of knowledge and information to, to bear. And, you know, you do that all on, on your own back. So um, an appreciation for what you do. And I learn a lot. So, and uh, I really appreciate you having me on to talk about this because I've been looking forward to it for a long time. So oh, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I look forward to having you back again. And again, if you guys are just getting into Bitcoin or even if you've been in for a while, you have questions about custody, don't even think for an extra second. Do what you need to do by going to the BTC advisor, 
and get in touch with Peter, get in touch with his team. He's got all the top guys in the industry that are trustworthy, and they're going to be there to help you get set up so that you can feel comfortable that you have the proper custody solution to protect the most important source of wealth that you have, the most important source of wealth for you and your family for generations to come. And the BTC advisor can help you do that. Peter, thank you so much for joining me. And I look forward to having you back again. Thanks so much. Appreciate you, Tom. Great to chat.